me an intro. We'll start there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Now I have to think of a hook. Yep. Um, no, man, I'm Matthew McKee. I'm from Boise, Idaho. I grew up here. I was, I'm a Californian, you know, God, God forbid. But uh, I lived here for most of my life. So my mom moved me here when I was a kid. Um, I joined the military when I was 17 as a light wheel mechanic because I was a pacifist back then. Really? <laughs> yeah. And I went because I was, uh, had a partial scholarship to USC for football and that was kind of my mom's dream for me to play football there. And oh. I, there was no way for me to afford the rest of it. So I was like, oh, I'll join the military and get them to pay for it. And then through going through basic training and um, AIT, I kind of thought, you know, like, oh, maybe maybe I'm cut out for this. And I quickly, I immediately switched from uh, a mechanic into a combat uh, medic. And I was What branch? Army. Army. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Army. And... Uh, Ended up switching from that to PSYOPs and went through a local selection for 19th group um, just, to, just to see if that was something that I wanted to do. And that was towards the very end of my the, my Army career, and that was about eight, eight years in. Um, the Army pissed me off because there was, like, some recruit, recruiting issues. Like, I wanted to go active duty um, and switch and get a, the 18 series, you know, yep. um, contract. And they're like, oh, no, we'll, we'll, the best we can do is get you a uh an infantry contract mm -hmm. we'll get you airborne the problem once you, once you, know? you get in yeah, yeah, yeah. once you get yeah, in once you get in and i was like no nah, dude like I've, I've been in for eight years like i i get this like i, I know i know the game you know no. like give me 18 series and then and i'll re-enlist and they just like wouldn't they're like we can't do that sorry dude we can't do that and i was like all right whatever so i ended up switching over to air force um became attack p went through the pipeline and okay I, yeah. all right all right you've done a lot <laughs> So, what part of California are you from? Oceanside. Oceans. Oh, damn! You had to deal with all the Marines. Yeah, I and mean, you still went Army, huh? Mm-hmm. I, I guess I could probably see that. Yeah. If I had to live around. See, so I'm from Clayton, New York, originally upstate. Okay. So, 10th Mountain Division is 20 minutes south of us. So I had to deal with all the we call them the bum drums. Yeah. And so, yeah. So I, I could see I could see that. So after the you joined the Army, where, where was boot camp? That was uh, or basic. What do you guys have? Yeah, Fort. No, it's basic. Uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. How was that? That's a culture shock. Oh my God! I hate Oklahoma with a passion. Why? Just the weather. Like it was. I mean, I remember this one time. We were PTing at like three thirty in the morning. You know, just <laughs> typical basic training stuff. And we're in shorts and a t-shirt because it's like 70 degrees and it just gets hotter throughout the day mm -hmm. and it's like super dry so the wind and the, and windy so the grass is very dry and the wind will pick up and like slice you like it's just like a little paper cl cuts you know well you got those california sandal feet so you know yeah i'm yeah you know i'm if <laughs> if i'm not on a beach i'm just not comfortable <sighs> yeah right <laughs> And then one day, our and our drill sergeants always said, "Hey, as long as you guys are dressed like us, you're okay, you're good." And then one day we go out to formation, like nothing else in our summers, and it's 30 degrees, you know, and we're just like shivering. It shifts like, that much there. Yeah, it was oh. wild. I mean, I didn't have a thermometer, so I'm probably exaggerating, but it was hot to cold. You know, oh, yeah, it's yeah, summers absolutely. the winter PTs, and they walk out, they stroll out like 20 minutes of us just standing in formation, and they're like smoking us because they're like, "What are you privates doing? We told you to dress like us." And obviously, like there was no way for us to see what they were dressed like. Um, Good games, the games that the, are the always freaking played. games. Yeah, exactly. Um, I tell people boot camp was, for me, boot camp was one of the most memorable parts of the military for me. I mean, it was, I mean, if you take yourself and really break it down as like, you're some just punk kid, most of us mm -hmm. were not given a crap. And then all of a sudden you're just thrown into pure structure. <laughs> I mean, overnight. And it, that's where I discovered, I mean, my, my, when I realized I really like had no idea what I signed up for was mm -hmm. in the airport when we landed and they told me to get nut to butt on a dude. And I looked at the guy like, well, well, I don't know what nut to butt means. Yeah. And then they just shove you into another dude's back. And so your, your nose is on the back of his head and obviously nuts on his butt. And that's when I was like, I fucked up. Yeah. I, <laughs> that's I didn't moment. sign up for this. <laughs> so my moment was we got four minutes and they like set a timer to call our parents and like, hey, this is our mailing address. I can't talk to you from now on, but this is our ma mailing address. And of course, this is like 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember I get... I. And they give it to you and then they're like, okay, you got to take your phone and your battery out and put it in this box. And I'm just thinking like, how are we ever going to get our like match everything? But I was, you know, too, too fast to think. So I'm going through it 
And then I remember the timer goes off and I had my phone all apart. And then I was like, oh, I accomplished a mission. But this one dude was still on the phone. He's like, I love you too, mama. You know, crocodile tears. The drill sergeant took the phone. And to, to today, I do not know how he got away from this. And just like... Victory punts that freaking phone. Times have changed. <laughs> it just blows up. Times have changed. Million pieces. Um, and that's when I was like, oh, they can do whatever they want to us. Mm-hmm. Like, we are we are not people in this area. Like, we're not, we're not people anymore. No product of the government. So the phone call part is hilarious because, <clears throat> you know, you, that's you see it in the videos mm-hmm. and like the little recruiting videos and stuff. So I get to boot camp. Well, unknown to me, like right before I leave was I left right after New Year's Eve. Well, on New Year's we have like this going away party for me. We're all all my buddies. We're still in high school. We all end up buzzing our heads that night. They're like, ah, oh, Brian's going in the Marine Corps. Like we're doing it yeah. for you. And I was like, well, okay, well, yeah. cool. Like I, I was gonna buzz when I get there, I guess. Uh-huh. So I buzz my head right before we go. And then when I show up, they do you're, you're doing your orientation, and they're separating people in the platoons. Mm-hmm. They throw me into this platoon and we're over there doing our, you know, getting our initial gear and doing whatever while the other platoon's making their initial phone call. Like, hey, this is Private Marshall. I made it to Parasite, whatever. Yeah. I, I never got to make that call. I, so they put me in the wrong platoon. I was the wrong marshal. So while my platoon was getting their phone calls mm-hmm. and haircuts, I was doing like the SIF where I was getting checked yeah. in. Well, then we switch. And as we're switching, they're like, who are you? And I tell mm-hmm. them, you're in the wrong platoon. Go to this platoon. Yeah. So now they're doing their sift. So I just showed up and stood there. Well, oh, I'd cut no. my hair like three days before, yeah. three days before, you know, right before. So, so it's short. But I, so now I look like I'm blended with these people. Uh-huh. So I never got to make my phone call. Oh, and man. and so my parents never had a clue if I made it. Like, <laughs> I can't be like, hey, I just, I didn't make a phone call. Yeah. Like, you know, you'd like, I'm scared shitless. Right. Like, you don't even, you're just staring at the floor. Well, then like three, four days into boot camp, once we got picked up in our platoon, I got hazed all day for my hair. And I got labeled this hippie because they're like, how's your hair growing this fast? And I could try to explain to these drill instructors, like this recruit was in this platoon and this, and and they're like, shut up. You know, they just start hazing me over it. Cause I had, so everybody had a buzzed head and I had like fuzz. Like, and so dude, it was like, that was like, this is my life now. Like I screwed up so bad. Like, I don't even know what I did. Like, it's not even my fault. And I'm Mm -hmm. just getting destroyed. Dude, there'd be a random drill instructor walk by and be like, Get it just because of my hair, and I'm just like I can't help yeah. it. Like you know, rule just... number one: don't be that guy. And I was I, from the st- from the first day till I stepped on those footprints to the last day, and I graduated. I was 100 percent that, that guy. guy. No, uh, I, I'm gonna have one of a couple. Of, I, so there's four dudes that I went to boot camp with, not with, but we met. Mm-hmm. We're in the same platoon, and we ended up serving together for deployments we were went to schools together hit the fleet together so we're really close and so i want to have them on and just talk because it is some of the stories are absolutely insane so but yeah so you're at boot camp which i would love to hear any more stories about that because they they just they i love any basic training boot camp stories yeah another i guess even before that we were all getting off the buses and you know we have our like we have our our rucks on the front and then we have our our big a bags on the back and yep. we're like trying to waddle around as little 17 year old like numb skulls and trying to get off the bus as fast as possible and i remember that um one of the drill sergeants was in like by the driver or he was the driver and he was just standing like telling them get out get out get out and uh oh man this is like bringing back even before that <laughs> we're like heads down and they're like don't yep. lift up your head and they're like why are you making eye contact and then i remember the drills aren't being like i don't i don't know can we curse on this yeah dude. Yeah, okay okay yeah, yeah. this is, wild <laughs> this is for veterans by veterans like can yeah. we curse like i just i just <laughs> nerded myself out um there was, was the like, air force coming yeah, out yeah i know <laughs> aim high <laughs> The drill sergeant was like, next person that makes eye contact, I'm going to rip you out of your seat and butt fuck your soul. <laughs> I'm just like a 17 year old, like Christian boy, like <laughs> never. Oh been t- God, don't butt fuck my soul. <laughs> like what did I, you're just sitting there staring at the floor. Like I, I just want to go home. Yeah. I want to go home. <laughs> Mommy, mom. <laughs> yeah. But we're like, we're like coming out of the, the bus and they're like, j- you know, jumping out and trying to go as fast as possible. Their privates are jumping all like dump or, or, uh, dropping and like flipping all over the place. And 
one of these guys gets stuck, like his bag gets stuck and he can't quite turn. And the, the drill sergeant just like grabs both the seats and Sparta kicks this dude out. And then he's like sitting there like on his ruck, like a turtle. <laughs> just can't dude, if they, could, if they could get away with filming a Paris Island, uh, any kind of boot camp, basic training mm-hmm. would be the best, greatest reality show on the planet. Oh, just the pure, sure. the pure comedy that comes from drill instructors. Like I've always wanted to go back yeah. and just watch because like how they just completely just fuck with you yeah. all day over. And you're doing everything they're telling you and you still can't do right. And no, so it's, uh, yeah. God, I love it. I absolutely love just it. Just being a fly on the wall. But the problem is, is like, even if you're watching that, like from the safety of your couch, you still like can never understand. Like you're like, why is that seven? Like you could just leave, you, the gate is right there. Like you can you just, just go. go, but you're in that moment. You're like terrified, terrified, terrified. I, and so I always tell people that I, I really appreciate my drill instructors mm-hmm. because they like, they actually gave a shit, you know, they actually cared. Yeah. yeah. And that's why they made our lives so fucking hard. And what year was this? This was uh, 2011. I got to ask, because this is the Marine. I mean, did, yeah. when did they come out with the timeout cards or the safety cards for the Army? That was, I don't, that was a real thing. I, st- I checked out. I know it was a real thing. I don't, I don't way even after, know. That way was after way you. after. Okay. Yeah. All right. All and right. Um, my platoon, I think it was one of the last platoons I was male only in... Uh, at Fort Sill for basic really? training. Yeah. But we were right next to another platoon that was co ed. Yeah. And I remember one of our drill sergeants was like, Don't you dare look at all those cum dumpsters over there. Dude. And I was sitting there like, Again, I'm this little 17 year old Christian boy. You don't even like, know what that means. Yeah, I'm like, What? How can you talk about that? Like, she might be underage. Like, what is happening? <laughs> yep. You know, we, we, so at Paris Island, that's where, I don't know if it's changed now, but that's where the female Marines would go. They did, instead of San Diego, I think they go to San Diego now, but we don't see any of them. They separate them mm-hmm. on the part of that. But on the rifle range, that's where we kind of all come together. And I'll never forget, because you're just, you know, you're dealing with Marines and you, get, you got that famous just frog voice from, mm-hmm. you know, Marine drill instructors and all that good stuff. But, I'll never forget, we were staged outside of a chow hall in this platoon of female Marines come walking by, but they were like a couple of phases ahead of us. So they were like doing cool cadences and marches. And it was like angels coming out of the heavens. Like all of us were like, there is women here. Like, cause you women know, you exist. Just, you, they exist. You know, never, there's, you've never seen so many naked dudes in your life until you join the military. That's all you're, then you hear these women you're like, Oh, thank God. Like, like this is great and that, you know, and so that's, that's where we would see him was at church because at boot camp everybody's religious because oh, the drill yeah. instructors can't get in the church. Mm-hmm. That's where they, so you could go in there and just, everyone's got their little moon beam doing like the, you know, this little light is mine. And I, I'm like, I don't even give a shit. Yeah, like I'm just, I will do whatever it takes <laughs> for an not hour. to be cleaning right now. It's an yeah. hour we're on a Sunday that yeah. you were drill instructor free for us. And that's where we would see the women on the rifle range and you'd go. And like, it was just, it was hilarious to even think, look back on it now and be like, good God. Like, yeah, this is, I mean, <clears throat> one thing that I identified when I was, and this is what actually like my trajectory of trying to go and be an elite task or an elite force was when I went to AIT from basic training. What's AIT? Oh, that's after initial training. Okay. It might be some other acronym, but I've been out of the Army for a long time. Yeah. I'm a civilian guy, so give me a break. You know? <laughs> um, uh, anyways, it's – so it's the – the like your reclass – or not re- reclass, but your specialty school. For, Got it. So mine yep. was like a mechanic. Everybody there was so fucking undisciplined. Like we're all coming straight out of basic Ooh, training, yeah. and I'm like – what are you like? I'm like, lock it up, lock it up. You know, like they're going to go come fuck us. And then it was just like a college course or something. And yep. I was like, all like, the fear. Oh, I was like, this is what it's like. Why are you treating me like an adult? I haven't been treated this way in like nine weeks, guys. Mm-hmm. Like what is happening? It's a trick. And oh, dude, it was, I mean, it was just <clears throat> everybody, nobody had discipline. Mm-hmm. It was, it was, everybody was like stand, like talking in formation or whatever. And I was like petrified. I'm like, they are going to kill us. Like I'm going to be <laughs> like these assholes. Yep. And there was three of us from Fort still and we were the only disciplined ones everyone was like crazy and that's when i kind of had a respect of like doing the hard thing will put you leagues above people who had it easy um and that kind of set the trajectory but going back to the fun stories like we have i i remember there's three distinct stories and i'll never forget these moments from basic training to your point of like they last forever yes one of them was week two this kid named church Um, he was like this overweight, like he just had enough. He's like, I want to quit. I'm out. Like I'm going to get, it's called getting chaptered out. Okay. Um, 
he's like, I'm like ringing the bell, like I'm out. Um, our drill sergeant, drill, yeah, our drill sergeant were like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll let you out. The kid ended up doing the whole like, the whole basic training with us up till week eight. No, he did the whole. He did everything. The gas chamber. He did all the ruck marches. He did absolutely everything. And we're like, they're like, we can't leave you alone. I think week like three or four, um, the kid was like, oh, I'm gonna kill myself. I need to get out of here. So then they had, <laughs> we had um, 24 hour uh, fire watch on this dude, and it was like they had they normally it's just like one person per hour or whatever. Um, in this, I, we probably had like 30 people in our bay. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not that bad, but for him, we had to have six people, two on each or one person on each corner and then two people and yeah, just watch just him because, all night. Just because so now we had to have seven fire watches <laughs> and we found out that if he woke up or if he came to the drill hall the next day with like a magic, uh, you know, broken nose, Wound or, on not him, broken yeah. nose that that's dramatic, but like, you know, a mm-hmm. uh, bruise or something like we, we wouldn't get smoked. So like, oh, really? Yeah, for probably like five days straight, we just spent the night like like soap in a freaking sock, <laughs> so, just beating yeah, this dude just, with. <laughs> yeah, I could, we did that. I laugh now, but that is horrible. <laughs> like I, <laughs> you know, thinking back at it, and this kid, but he did everything, and then week eight, he by now he's like actually doing well like he passes his pt test and he's like you know shooting and he's in it and they're like okay your chapter came through here you go they kick him out week eight after he's done everything out of a 12 week yeah uh, 13 13 weeks close enough i think no it's nine weeks for basic and then okay so he was like at at graduation and they're like you're out dude just savage we had a dude that got dropped from us literally a week but he had like shin splints and he couldn't he, he couldn't even walk and I mean, I guess they pick up from if you get dropped and, yeah. you know, for medical reasons, whatever mm-hmm. you pick up, you go into a waiting platoon. And then when you're, so I guess he, uh, like phases, but still he had to sit there until he was healed. And we ended up picking up, um, we picked up this kid, man. I'll never forget his name. His name was Roundtree because the drill instructors called him Square Bush. <laughs> and which like, like, just because, and um, we ended, he ended up ratting on us one night because we snuck out to the dumpsters and uh-huh. they made us like um go through and take all the good stuff out of our MREs before we did our crucible yeah and we snuck out to the dumpsters that night and just gorged Rat ourselves oh yeah. dude so bad he ratted on us and oh, yeah and no. so we ended up we ended up doing the old sock and mm-hmm. bar soap and a sock to him one night like we had like three dudes hold down his blanket you know <laughs> and so he couldn't move and bunch of dudes just thumped them pretty good and then we ended up getting a lot of trouble for that though like our drill instructor hazed the living hell out of us and so it was it was one of those things and they said if we touch them again it would be even worse and we were literally like weeks away from graduating we were in third phase you yeah. know you get to blouse your boots and like get a fade on your haircut and and when we we ended up having to unblouse our boots and like they buzzed our heads all again because we got caught sneaking into the dumpsters right before yeah. we graduated but dude those are some of the wildest times and like what you will do is like a like a kid mm-hmm. you know like as and you know you're gonna get in trouble like i got smoked every day like i didn't there was a day i didn't have fire watching from midnight to one that was yeah. my schedule like the drone structure just be like scribe mm-hmm. marshall zero zero and i'd be like Fuck. like i never got a full night sleeve of boot camp like my best friend of this day he, i and this is crazy people people don't believe me when i tell us unless he's with me i never learned how to clean my rifle at boot camp i never knew i never learned how to disassemble a rifle Really? I got hazed every rifle maintenance uh-huh. where they were teaching us. I was on the quarter deck, just getting slayed. And so, like, it, it became that guy. I, uh, dude, when I say I was that guy, yeah. that they used to take me every time a new platoon would pick up or a new series would pick up mm-hmm. at boot camp. They would, I was the kid that they brought to demonstrate all the platoons. I'd go floor to floor as they're giving their speeches, and that was their demonstration of how they're going to get hazed on the quarter deck. Oh my god! Just hours of that yeah. all day. Like, so my rack mate would literally he knew my combos. He would go and do his combo, undo his, take his rifle, assemble it or disassemble it, get my and like so he yeah. was doing double of everything, and I'd just be standing on the quarter deck, like literally take my blouse off, and I'd just stand at attention until the drill instructor came out of the house and just he would, be, he would just snap and point at me and I just yeah. haze myself like for all of rifle maintenance and I and once I got to MCT after that they had to like I was like yo can you teach me how to take apart this fucking gun super embarrassing I, bro but I need this yeah, even yeah rifle range it didn't matter and whenever there was rifle maintenance that meant Marshall go haze yourself and I would just get ready and they would just haze me for the whole rifle maintenance so I never knew how to disassemble a rifle at boot camp 
That's wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my last, our last PT test, I woke up with, I ended up finding out later that I had walking pneumonia, oh. but I, I was like, <clears throat> delirious you know i couldn't even shave myself so my battle buddy <laughs> is what we call him yeah, yeah uh he ended up shaving me and he like got me at and he was i can't remember how but he kept me like standing somehow with oh he was behind me and he would just like tap me he's like hey when you're gonna fall just fall back and like he would tap me forward you know um and kept me going and then and then from some i was like a PT <laughs> stud back then i, oh, yeah. I made the freaking i made it through but i crossed the finish line because we do push-up sit-ups and then the two mile run i crossed the finish line with just like shit everywhere dude i blew out mid run no <laughs> yeah and the drill instructors were like what like mckee what what are you doing like i was like oh, i just had to go to the bathroom drill sergeant <laughs> they're like just go clean yourself up and i went and i remember like i went and passed out in the bathroom and, like they had to come uh, my battle buddy threw away all my stuff got me like clean me up and then i i can't even i don't even remember i think next day was like um family day so oh, right before yeah. so i think my mom took me to the freaking doctor and was like during hey. family day yeah, and because my son's dying <laughs> <laughs> seriously and they're like yeah dude you have walking pneumonia and they like plugged me in and they gave me some drugs and i was like you can't tell my drill sergeant that's drill sergeant wild. you can't do it you can't do it they're gonna wash me back day one because that was their thing they're like if you if yep. you can't pass a pt test today day one wash back and i was like there is no fucking wait i'm starting I'm going, over. yeah no, no way not a chance yeah that is some of the wildest times man absolutely wild and then what we do like and put our bodies through just because like we're some dumb kid and like we want to be in the military and it's like i look back at enough like if i did boot camp these days i'd be like like yeah <laughs> i'll get it done it's yeah. gonna get you know and so it's, it's just funny to think i couldn't even imagine going through boot camp now how much has changed like politically Man. In the military, like we, you know, from customs, mm -hmm. traditions, the, I mean, hazing was just a part of everything coming up yeah. in the military there in our days. And I think we were like that last generation that got to get away with it, like getting hazed. Mm -hmm. And like, I had a buddy that just retired out of the Marines as a Sergeant major. And dude, he got NJP'd with, not with me, I dodged, he ended up getting caught in his room and got NJP'd when we were like troops. I mean, crash trucks and fights and, I mean, the wildest shit. Yeah. And he's, I was talking to him in his retirement, and he's like, I was like, what are you doing, man? He's like, bro, I'm just, I'm just writing out my time. Like, I, these kids, yeah. they, they know their rights. They've, they request to talk to the chaplain. Like, they, they will dime you out. And he's like, Dude, you can't get away with anything anymore. He's like, I'm just doing my time. So it's definitely changed a lot in the military. It would just suck. It, it does suck because you're thinking about, like, these, this, and I never, I don't want to be <clears> one of those dudes that's like, oh, my time was so much yeah. harder. Like, no, everybody's before us yeah, was. Yeah, yeah exactly. I get it. But the thing, like, I have friends that are drill sergeants today, and they're same thing. They're like, I can't even cuss at these people. Like, and and you can't make them do more than like twenty push-ups at a time, or That's maybe wild. it's even more than ten push-ups at a time. It's like they made us do ten thousand. Obviously, we couldn't do ten thousand, but you just yeah. like at that point, you're like, me, you know, oh, like dude, hating just, life. Yeah. It's not. I remember they smoked us until th this was their fun favorite game. They would smoke us until the ceiling would start raining. With just like be in our bay, just mm -hmm. because. Of Were you guys in squad base then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. They would make us take all of our wall lockers down to um, the the drill pad and then make us sleep outside mm -hmm. for the night. And they're like, if you're not gonna respect this bay and keep it clean, then they'd go up and then they they would just dump everything, you know. Um, <laughs> this one time. We're <laughs> Dude, the military is just so wild. Yeah, it's people and we sign creativity. up for this. I know we and sign up like, for shit pay. Yeah. Like, oh, I want to be a marine. And like, you're like, oh man, I did this all on my own. I can't be mad at anybody but myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's not on any of the commercials. Like, I wanted to slay lava dragons and wear dress blues and climb mountains and shit. You know, like in the commercial, and I just nut to butt at an airport. I was like, this was not in any of the fine print. Right. Seriously. <laughs> um, no, but we're so we had to move all of our stuff down from the the bay down to the drill pad and um this kid had his wall locker and he does a 550 cord ties it around it and then ties it around his neck and we're in the second story and he's like i'm gonna dump this thing i'm killing myself like i want it out <laughs> and the drill are like drills are drills and we're dumb 17 year old kids like can't think for ourselves because we haven't gotten a full night's sleep and we're all like yeah. running around like chickens and we're like oh no drills are drills are and he's gonna kill himself the drills aren't runs up and he's like what are you doing private and he sees he so the drills aren't, I'll, I'll tell the, 
I'll just tell it like this. The drill sergeant goes up, assesses the situation, and he just walks up and Sparta kicks that thing off to the side. And the look of the kid's face when he sees the drill sergeant's like, kill yourself. Doosh. Here, kicks I'll do it, it off. for you. Yeah. <laughs> and then what we didn't realize because we're dumb privates was, and that's, people don't understand when you're in that situation, you are literally like a dumb private. That's not an oh, insult. That's just no. an assessment of the situation. You can't even hardly wipe your own ass at this stage. <laughs> yeah. Like you, you think you went from like, oh, I was like an all-star athlete. Like I worked, you know, through high school. Then you get yeah. to boot camp and you're like, dude, like completely lose track of everything. Cause you're just so exhausted yeah. and you just broke off the and, whole time. And your mind is going in so many different and they keep you going. They're and you're like, terrified. Okay, you got to eat. Look yeah. in the wrong direction. Exactly. And they're like, you got to eat super. F-. I remember the first couple of weeks they put uh, two spoons in our hands and duct tape them every single day for chow. And we just had to shovel as fast as we could. And then they had to, we had, we got smoked until we figured out how to get the duct tape off our hands every day for two weeks. So we're all like malnutrition. Oh, for sure. We're freaking mal- malnourished. Malnourished. <laughs> malnourished is the word, you know, I'm, I go back to, I think about boot camp and I turn in that dumb. Right. All over kid. again. Um, <clears throat> and then we're like, you know, we, then we get like figure out tricks. We're like, I'm only going to tape, like duct tape the back. So one time. Yeah. Good. I'm going to do one loop instead of like <laughs> Edward 40 hands where yeah. you're just using a whole roll of duct tape. There's so many little things like that, but it was, it was such a good time in your life. Like when you think back at it now, like, but you can't talk about this with normal people, like civilians in yeah. a way. Right. Cause like, they're never going to understand what it was like. Just, just standing there. And like, I was standing in the chow line. So you're a tall dude. Yeah. Were you in the front or did you eat last? When did you get your chow? I think they did it by name so i was in the middle oh, so, so i was always in the middle no matter like if oh they went. that's nice yeah. see they would do ours by height so the little end would go in first and there was times where i'd literally get my tray and i'd turn and they'd be like get the fuck out of it you're like like on the way to the trash can trying to just shove food mm-hmm. in your mouth and you're just like yo this is bullshit like these little dudes get to eat their whole meal and just because i'm tall like yeah. it's a that's the kind of stuff that wears on your mind and you're just the, the psychology behind it they they break you down oh, for, for sure. sure yeah for sure well so they did it and they would reverse it they'd be like <clears throat> okay a's in the front and then for dinner it'd be like z's in the front you know um so what i would always be in the middle yeah. so if we only got four minutes to eat I would always be towards the end. Got you know? it. Like, because it would be like half you get to eat for breakfast and half you get to eat for dinner, basically, is yep. how they did it. So it was like for the first couple of weeks, it, I mean, I lost a lot of weight. Oh. But so to finish the story, to make sure that everyone knows that my that drill sergeant didn't like kill this kid, <laughs> was the kid tied the, the, the 550 cord to the uh, wall locker and then it went down to the spool and it was a full spool of 550 cord <laughs> and then tied it around his neck <laughs> and just this drill sergeant yeeted it off and like obviously it just unravels plenty, yeah, yeah it was like plenty of there was i mean miles of 550 cord so <laughs> yeah. it wasn't a big <clears throat> issue but so after boot camp you get your orders to where yeah that was uh i went to virginia oh yeah. my god they're just putting yeah, you all Fort over Lee, the place virginia what's but, that like I mean, it was, it was really cold. Like it was just really wet, cold okay. um, by the time I went. And that was, I don't even remember. I think AIT, I was just angry all the time. Cause yeah. I was like, how'd you, you guys are so undisciplined. And I just hated it. Cause I was at that point, I was 100% indoctrinated, you know, like Drinking I was the Kool-Aid. Oh, I dr- I guzzled that Kool-Aid. See, I was that, since I was that guy, I never drank. And I think that's why they just, they couldn't get me to like conform all the way. I always fought everything. Oh, so that's where I was just like public enemy number one to all the drill instructors because I questioned everything. Yeah, I, you yeah. would ha- probably have hated me. In other words, like probably do. I'd have been that dude, like shut up, boot, like get in yeah. line. <laughs> You'd be like this guy. Like I was, I was hundred percent that guy. That's awesome. That's amazing because <laughs> that's definitely like the last couple of years in my. I mean, I went from transition from like drinking the Kool Aid of like mm-hmm. trying to be the cool guy and doing the next best thing to like the last couple of years. I'm like entrepreneurial, like trying to teach the dudes like, yo, yeah, yeah. use your VA loan, dude. Like you could get get a free house every other year you know like yeah and like totally was the shit bag at that point you yeah. know like, oh yeah i'm yeah. like dude there is a better way guys like you there's, there's a whole a, other world out there you can literally do whatever you want and get somebody else to pay for it if you're just a little bit clever yeah if you just get out mm-hmm. and start your life which i definitely want to get into so in during your time in the army i mean you did what eight years you said mm-hmm. and then so that just wasn't for you what made you decide to go air force well, so the army pissed me off and it was that recruiter situation because okay. I was like, I did the, um, <clears throat> I did, uh, a, a stent with, uh, 
the, I assessed with second group or second um, bat out of JBLM okay. to like try to be a, a medic with the Rangers. Yeah. How was that? Um, I mean, that was cool. Like all the guys were super good. That's yeah. where I learned about like contracting and like, oh, you could make, and this is the most entrepreneurial I was like, I could go do the same job somewhere else and make twice as much, yeah, you yeah. know? Um, and Which then, never panned out. <sighs> I went, I did contract it too. And I was like, I'm gonna make $10,000. And you're like, yeah. I'm paying Afghan taxes. Yeah. Like, they don't tell you that shit. You're like, this is, this is wild. The big thing is when I got like doing psyop stuff, you know, then your bosses, you, you have no idea who's employing you. Okay. And then just morally speaking. Can you get like, into the psyops part of things? Can I you, mean, can you talk about that? Uh, I don't know. What do you, what do you want? I mean, I find psyops like, like what, what, what was your role? Like, I mean, what you guys are spying, you guys collecting Intel, like what's psyops? So like? we don't do Intel, right? We do, we okay. gather information and then the Intel guys take that information and mm. convert it to Intel. Okay. Um, is the, is the way to, is actually how it goes. Like we just take in information and it's cool. There's a bunch of different teams. So there's like, um, Gosh, I don't even know. Like, I don't want to get too weird into it, but there's um, typically three different teams. There's like a team that'll go in and gather information from just like what the space is in the area. So okay. like how they disseminate information. Like, is it just posters? Is it leaflets? If is it, Do they have a radio station? Do they have a TV station? Um, like how established is this tribe? And then there's people that go kind of to the human side of things of like, who's the top dude? Um, is he a good guy or is he a bad guy or, you know, somewhere in the gray. And then there's a team that figures out how to disseminate the information. Uh, and then there's different ways that they disseminate the information and it's white, black, and gray. And basically white is like, this is an American message from America. Um, I don't even know if I want to go into this. Um, yeah, you're good. Go. Yeah, you're good. Uh, black is, or gray is like, this is, a message okay not signing by anyone and then black is like this is a message from x people okay you know? and this is like to village elders or could be to anybody or to the populace typically psyop we go in with like the i guess the highest um psyop like what you want to do is we go in with like the green berets and they do their mission the, the green berets mission is sick like they give a like we want this outcome and then the Braves go in there and they figure out how to get that outcome. Like okay. they, they take it from start to finish. Uh, Psyop dudes just support them in that mission. And usually we, we take it, we figure out how to disseminate what information to get to that outcome. Um, which I totally nerded out on. Way you know? smarter dudes than, than I could ever try to probably figure out. I mean, so are there guys there that were like your recon or uh, rangers would be in like gathering intel first and then they're passing it down or are there psyops like in town? Like how, do, how are you guys even like how, so, do, how does psyops collect info? Yeah, typically when I was uh, when, the way that I saw it done yeah, um, or the way that I heard it was done was – the psyops would just be embedded, kind of like a tac P, what I do now. Like, we go in okay. with the teams, and we're just a force multiplier. And it's just a one or two dude team that's just rolling yeah. in, just collecting intel. Yeah, typically to one dude that's right there, and he's... Got a terp with them, and just, mm -hmm. okay, okay. Yeah. And that's it. And then we just, we assess, like, how the information is being distributed, what's being distributed. Are they an allied force? Do they like us? Do they not like us? Like, okay. And then that's getting fed out to the other units that are in the area too, with some of that information. I mean. So that information <laughs> goes to the Intel guys. And yeah. then the Intel nerds, those dudes sort through everything. Gather and then it they, all. Yeah. And then they conglomerate and they, they tell us what that information, that they don't tell us, sorry. They tell the other units mm -hmm. what that information means. Got and it. And they package it really clean. Like okay. I just raw data collect. Got it. And then... Pass it on. Pass it on. So after you got that, then you, what did you transfer to? Um, so you went. That was when I was um, assessing and like just a local assessment, kind of yep. like I did for my TAC P unit. Mm -hmm. and I wanted to go Green Beret because I was, I, those guys are cool. Yeah. <laughs> they obviously. have a cool mission. I love the, I love the mission set. Uh, and then I wanted the 18X um, contract. I couldn't get it because the recruiter and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go to the Air Force and do this job because I found out that I was living in Washington State at that point, point. Okay. and I found out that TACP was right here in town, like in Boise, Idaho. I was yeah. like, I can be special warfare <clears throat> and I can live back home. Like, I'm going to go do it's that. Win -win, yeah. And I remember this. 
I remember this recruiter was like, oh, you're going to have to go through a whole new assessment after that. And you're going to have to go through like Air Force basic training and, and all that. And I was like, okay. Like I was planning on yeah. going through Q course, you know, like. Did you I, have to do all that? Trying. Did you have to go through Air Force boot camp again? No, I didn't have to go through Air Force oh, basic Because you had training. enough time in, you did eight or whatever, or just... It's it's because I already went through Army basic, so I was prior service. Yeah. I don't know why I did that. I was actually prior service, you know. Um, but if you, from what I understand, if you go from Air Force to, like, Army or Marines, then you would have to go through Army and Marine basic training because, or boot camp, because yep. Air Force basic training is a whole nother level of, like, total bullshit. Like, I've heard. Just, just ridiculous it's it's a it's an insult really to our service members i think um i think the air force is run more like a corporation than actually a, oh it's a hundred percent business that's why all these air force bubbles they all got like just massive businesses and their own companies i mean mm-hmm. they set them up from day one it's, it's a business yeah for it's sure. kind of like senators and their trading like yeah. all it's it's amazing how every senator is just a world-class trader you know mm-hmm. they go into senate making a two hundred thousand dollar salary and come out with like 100 a 10 million, million yeah, yeah, yeah. net worth. Um, <clears throat> the Air Force is interesting for sure. Like I, I obviously in the Marines, we didn't have a lot of um, crossover, but we didn't get to do some training. We, I was fortunate enough to go. They were shutting down an Air Force base for like a part of it in California, and they sent us out there with our vehicles to do some like um, like urban training. Mm-hmm. And they put us up and they're like, and I'll never, I'll never forget this as long as I live. We show up and there's just the most just beautiful air force woman like takes us in i was like yeah what the fuck like there i haven't seen a woman like there's in my job you know in in our mos at the time we didn't have women anywhere around where we were Mm -hmm. stationed so we show up and this woman is just beautiful and i'm just like what and i'm like i think i was like a lance corporal so i'm just shutting up and just taking it all in my staffs aren't that was with was like the biggest turd of a human being which i didn't know at the time and uh anyways we get there and they're like, okay, you know, we, you guys were last minute where we had to stick you in the overflow birthings and, in the, or in the barracks. Yeah. And I was like, okay, like whatever. And just, yeah. We show up. They had TVs, fridges, the beds were made. I mean, it was, and they're like talking to us like this is, they're putting us in the slum part yeah. of this base. And I, I walked in there and I was, and they had a, we had um, Jack and Jill bathrooms that I mm-hmm. shared with like my roommate or the, my buddy that was in the room next to us. And I'll never forget, open the door, and he opened the door, and we're like, we should have joined the Air Force. We're like, what are we doing? Like, we're sleeping in our vehicles, yeah. like, you know, just, just hating life 99% of the time. But that was my first introduction to the Air Force was when we went. I, it was March Air Force Base just there in SoCal. And, dude, it was it was wild. But that was fun training. We, they let us plow through these houses with our tanks mm-hmm. and shit. And That's sick. after all the grunts were gone, they're like, hey, you guys can have fun. And so imagine base housing. Mm-hmm. That, and that was like during um, the Bush administration, or not Bush, Clinton. He started downsizing when he was doing it. Mm-hmm. Well, they shut down a huge portion of March Air Force Base, which was all family housing. Yeah. So imagine just rolling down the streets in a neighborhood with a tank. And like we would just full full throttle reverse into a house and just blow through a house. Like, I mean, they had dumpsters and cars and we were hitting, just mm-hmm. plowing through cars. I mean, there wasn't, it was my mission to take out every stop sign. Like, we would be yes. doing missions with the grunts, and they'd be like, okay, we need you down the street. I'd look down the other way, and there'd be a stop sign. I'd be like, and just drive down, run the stop sign over, turn around, and come back. And they're all standing. Like, and my crew chief's just like, just let them do it. I can't control this guy. But, yeah, the Air Force was a – it was a different world, man, completely different world than anything I'd ever been introduced to it by that point in my military career. Oh, I was 100%. Just, they definitely take care of their people. Um I got to hang out with army people the vast majority of the time yeah. when I was uh, Air Force because just that's who I would go. I would never yeah. deploy with like an actually that's not true. My unit deployed with uh, some PJs in okay. in Africa, um, but typically I was just with army the whole time. So yeah. it was it was kind of best of both worlds. Like when I got put up somewhere, like I was for JTAC QC, um, the the last course to get my JTAC um, cert before I go on to like the actually getting trained. Okay, you know just like blessed off the prequel yeah classes in like, a way. here here you go um you took the test you passed the standardized test now okay. go actually learn how to be a jtac through your unit which i want to go into jtacs mm, dude i'm coolest, sure a lot. i wouldn't want to do i think i would be a um like a green beret medic okay that would be cool. over it 
So what's a JTAC? Explain to me for everybody listening what J, what this I like. I, think I mean, it, I got an idea, but I've yeah, never. I think it's the greatest career field Why? in the DOT. Um, it's it's a sick job. So basically, we go out with the cool guys, the guys yep. that actually do it. Um, and then you are the most powerful asset on the battlefield. I'm probably biased when I say this. Why? But the reason is I have a radio and I have direct contact with a stack of probably a multi, multi-billion dollars worth of aircraft. And okay. I get to control them to drop the largest ordinance known to man onto some assholes that are trying to shoot at us. Yeah. Know? Okay. That's a flex for sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, I mean, yeah. Cause I mean, you're controlling a 10 so you're calling in you're calling an air airstrike airstrikes yeah. okay yeah. so a 10s you get Spooky to call and yeah all the, the, what's the big boy um the, the spooky c-130s c-130s yeah baby let's go <laughs> what's um, that like just talking with those dudes i mean it's, it's got to be pretty cool it's cool because you're a part of the cast team you okay. know so close air support team and like those dudes are dudes in the air you know like uh, you'll have some robots out there or whatever um but, drones you mean by yeah, robots yeah. okay um but the dudes in like the tens or the fifteens or the spookies, they're they're there to save your dudes. Like they're there yeah. to rage. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. You know? um, and you're just like, it's it's a humbling experience, you know, to see ordnance dropping out of an aircraft. Oh, and there's nothing you can't explain it. Yeah, there's and nothing it's like, like it. oh, you have and and then just the amount of knowledge that it takes. Like it is kind of a nerdy job, actually. Um, cause well, because one number, I mean, you're, you're taking out friendlies if you're one number off. or That's the thing. You know, And you have to know the, the battle space as good or better than the ground commander. Like, you have to <clears throat> keep track of what's happening in the air, but also the battle space. And you have to know where artillery is shooting and when it's shooting and where it's shooting through your airspace, you know, and then you have to deconflict all that. How are you processing? Like, do you guys, are you rolling with, like, I mean, what year was this? I mean, what year were you guys doing all this? When did you go through training for this? So I went through uh, 2018, and then I got out last week. <laughs> yeah, you're fresh. Um, I mean, do you guys have like like iPads or tough books? I mean, how yeah. are you how are you reading from ground to? I mean, what's a C1 float net? So C1s are are low. They're they're like freaking 500 feet and just in the stack. And that's only we don't do that when there's surface error yeah, or yeah, anything yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and just, just to be clear, I never deployed as a yeah, tech. Yeah. Like, I don't want to be, like, stolen valor or anything like that. No, no. Um, I've trained with plenty of live ordnance, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, so we have, like, a, a little, like, S7 or S9. I've seen this. Okay. Yeah, attached to our chest. And we have a whole picture of whatnot. Okay. Um, some units tie in, or they're starting to tie in with Link 16. Um, and that's just, like, basically the beacons of where everything is. Yeah, yeah, and, okay. And our radios connect with their radios. But is it, like, a, a newer Blue Force tracker? Did you exactly. ever use it? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, exactly. I remember going through those. Cl- and I was like, this is <laughs> this is the technology we have. We have people on the moon, and, like, mm-hmm. I have to use this Blue Force tracker. Like, it, That is wild. But a lot of that, also, we're training to the standard of, like, map and compass. You know, what, oh, if, what sure. if all that stuff sure. goes it away? Fails, because yeah. especially if we do a near peer. Or a peer peer like what's a peer 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 like a peer peer fight like a one of the big three you know China or Russia oh if okay, get in okay a conflict okay. with one of them like we can't use any technology like mm-hmm. if I if I key up on the radio they have it all yeah so um, I don't want to get away with like new stuff I like I don't want to get I'm, I don't know what I don't want to get into just edit that out uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah they're like they're like and week out like this guy gets court martialed yeah. <laughs> for giving away classified yeah. information yeah um no but to keep everything unclassed like we're training to the standard of um we have a, a lot of technology mm-hmm. but we don't want to do a lot of like you know radio discipline yeah, um, yeah. or we don't want to be keying up too long and we want to transfer information as short as short as possible in the smallest <clears throat> packages as possible so you can't detect us because uh, we don't want to be like beacons you know of like oh that's where the radio frequency is coming from yeah so if you got the coolest second coolest job in the military you, you think, I, think um, it, I think it's the coolest i'm saying the only other job i would consider is and, green beret and i'm i w- i got to the point you know, that I was like, I'm never going through a selection again. You yeah, know? Um, it's not easy on Specifically, you. The, the medics, like, those dudes do work. I got oh, to do yeah. a couple, like, I got to do some training with some Green Beret medics uh, when I was uh, just a little combat medic, you yeah. know. And those dudes are, like, plugging holes in the back of helicopters and, like, doing uh, crikes with freaking spoons. Like, wild stuff oh, i've seen some shit especially some recon medics man those mm-hmm. dudes they don't they just don't care they're yeah. like oh watch out make a hole you stand back and it's like 
Oh God, I didn't yeah. know you could do that. Like well, the thing is, is like in that situation, it's like this guy will die. Hundred percent for sure. So it's yeah. You can't. I'm, I'm gonna like maybe this is there's a ten percent chance, but ten percent is better than zero percent. So I'm you gotta go risk for it. it for the Brit biscuit. Yeah, baby. You know, if you're within that golden hour, or you're past the golden hour. You're doing whatever you can do to get the guys back. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So you got the coolest coolest job in the military, and you're deciding to get out. Why? Mm-hmm. This one was tough. Um, I think, well, so I had some medical stuff. Um, okay. Basically, I injured my meniscus, and um, it, uh, yeah, so I injured my meniscus, and I had to get surgery on it, and it was kind of like, hey, it's a bucket tear, uh, it's a bucket tear, bucket handle tear. Um, you can go two ways. We can either repair it, and you're going to have a six-month recovery, yeah. or if we can't repair it, then we'll just remove the piece that we can't repair, and then it's a two-week recovery, but you're going to be missing part of your meniscus. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was like, okay, you know, that's, that seems reasonable. In the process of, and I don't want to, like, throw egg on anyone. Um, I'll just give my side of the story yeah, and yeah. my understanding of the story with the limited information that I have. In this process, um, I there was a, a long delay. It was about a four month del- delay. And the surgeon, the civilian surgeon was kind of like, okay, let's go. Let's get like, we want to patch you up, mm-hmm. discovered this thing and we got to go take care of it now. So I send that out to the med group, the med group here, um, with, uh, they have about 1200 people and there was deployments during this time. So, uh, okay. so I understand like, you know, I'm not going to be You're the not priority. First priority. Yeah. It was a rush thing. Essentially, all I needed from the doctor or from the med group doctor, the, the military doctor, was to look at my at my MRI and say, oh, yeah, that is what it is. Like, let's get this guy his surgery because that is the only the only course of action to this kind of tear. Mm-hmm. Uh, that took four months. So by the really? time I actually got to my surgery, there the meniscus rubbed on itself and rubbed itself away. So all they could do was... <laughs> take it out good old military huh yeah and and when i woke up it was to the point where like the doctor's like hey you're either, either gonna wake up in a brace or you're gonna wake up with a uh, ace wrap if you're in the ace wrap we removed it if you're in a brace then get ready for a year long of therapy you know? yeah yeah but it's gonna be good as new yep. basically and i was like cool sick let's go for the brace you know i wake up no doctor around I had my, my ACE wrap on and I was like, you know, still like coming out of it mm-hmm. and the anesthesiologist was there and I was like, yo dude, like how bad? This, yeah. How bad? And he was like, I'm bro. I just like get you high. Like I just I put, put, I put, I put, put you, you to sleep. sleep. Yeah. 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 That's my only job. Yeah. yeah. That's what they all say. I oh. just put you to sleep. Yeah. I was like, okay. So then it takes me two weeks to get to my post op and I'm, this is still a civilian doctor and I'm like, I don't know what, like anything. What, yeah. So I get in there and he's like, okay, well it's bad. I was like, sick. And he's like, pretty much I had to re- remove your whole meniscus. And when I was in there, I realized that you have about 30% of the the cartilage that you should have at your age. Um, so you're pretty much bone on bone. And Ugh. the only thing to rectify that is a full knee replacement. Which the military is not wanting to hear any of this at this oh, point. Yeah. Either Absolutely. of you. Well, no. So, and he's like, oh, by the way. And I was like, okay, so when, when am I doing that? And he's like, when you're like 45 or 50. We can't do We don't yeah. recommend it now. Yeah, yeah. Too young like, for you're it. too young. And I was like, okay, so <clears> what do I do? And he's like, you're just going to have to like bite the bullet and deal with the pain. And I was like, what, like it, I, at this point I'm still on crutches. And yeah, I'm like, yeah. Kind of, oh yeah. Um, and I was like, okay, well, what's the pain going to be like? And he's like, really, really bad arthritis. <laughs> Like on your knee and, and you're 250 pounds. So like maybe lose some weight. Yeah. And I'm like, bro. And he's like, you're also never going to run again. And I was like, <laughs> you're Dog. Checking, checking yeah. every box yeah. on the way down. Like, yeah, that's great. Yeah. 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 Um, and he's like, good luck. Like, you know, he's like, you like, you look like you're a big dude. Like, do you weight lift? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, not anymore. Really? <laughs> like, yeah. Just straight up like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he was probably more of a civilian about it. But yeah. 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 Of course, like the way that I took in this information was like dread, 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 dread. Oh, yeah, you know? yeah. I was in a dark place. Okay. And that manifested, I was angry specifically at this medical provider on the military side that took so long to mm-hmm. review my documents, which I try to, I try to like give grace of understanding yeah. that side of it. But I just got told I'm never going to run again. I'm mm-hmm. never going to ruck again. I'm never going to bear weight again. So like, so I'm now like, you're blaming everything on the well, world at this I, point. Yeah, you're just pissed. I, and I'm like, I can't be attack P. Like I loved, I was, yeah, I loved being attack P. You know, like I was all in. I, I was, 
way into it, you know? And also I loved being in the military. I loved mm-hmm. like the whole lifestyle and the camaraderie and yeah. like trying to be best. I wanted to assess for uh, STS, which is the special tactics squadron, okay. which is like the top of um, the TACPs, you know, like that's where they go to do the real cool yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had all this plan out. I was like, I'm going to go. I had this deployment that I was supposed to go on. Um, and then I was going to come back and assess. You know, that was like, I was like, I got my life. I got the next six years for the rest you're of the set, military. Yeah. Like, I, I'm going to Going to career it. For, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And now you just whole world just crumbled. Oh, yeah. So I made some colorful statements to <laughs> <laughs> this medical provider. Which probably didn't help any of the situation. Well, unbeknownst to me, this specific provider was the absolute gatekeeper, the only person that deals with oh. medical discharges in my wing. So no. she was the one person that I go through for all things medical. Um, so you're just best friends with her now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then, and also like because of that, my unit is trying to keep track or keep keep their dudes safe yeah. and make sure that when their dudes are, cause I, like immediately when I'm, when I'm hurt and they're like, this guy can't be a tech P it's like, and I make an ass out of myself uh-huh. with this provider. It's like, okay, now we have to protect our people and make sure that they get <sighs> taken care of when they go through a medical thing. Mm-hmm. So they end up giving me a letter of reprimand for how I conducted myself, okay. which I think is justified. Like it was, okay. it, was, well, okay. it, was yeah. it was brutal. Take it on the chin. Um, yeah, exactly. But at that point, like it was game over for me being in that, in that space. So, you know, me, what do you mean? So like the second your unit finds out, like they're like, they're starting to push you out or what is that? Is that normal? I mean, are are you in or are you out kind of unit or what? Yeah. I mean, I, from what I understand, from what I hear of other dudes, like going out and I don't, I don't want to discredit my unit at all. Like I've, I've been given a lot, you know, um, and being, having the ability to be a TAC P in that unit specifically, um, just because of our ge- geological location, like we're in the mountains, we get to oh, do a lot sure. of cool stuff. We're next to the largest range on the West coast and we have access to a 10s. The, the, the best a 10 unit in the world. Cause they just won the gallant field or gallant hog gallant smoke. Field, yeah. Yeah. I got the, like, which I got invited to, dude, so, sick. which is the coolest shit ever dude. watching these a 10s come in at like 200 yards in front of you and just mm-hmm. sh- Scrafe, strafing, strafe, scrafing, strafing, strafing, yeah. strafing. And I mean, it was a cool thing. So like I could imagine just being that dude on the ground with your radio cause they were out there. Uh-huh. So yeah. So now all yeah. like those dudes win almost every year too. So yeah. they're it's unfortunate. Like, it's going there. I guess they're going to Phoenix next year, but we won't even get in the hog smoke. That's a whole different yeah. story. I got, I actually have a pilot that's going to come on. And we're going to talk about that. Oh, no way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is it Madman? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a couple of them, so I'm Super trying to get a, I'm trying dude. to get a group of them going. So he's one of them. Those guys are all good dudes. <clears throat> Anyways, I was very fortunate to be in the unit that I was in, and I really appreciated all the training and everything. So I want to I f- want to forefront this. Yeah. And I do understand like the fuck the one to take care of the many. So like I'm not even saying what they did was wrong. You were the sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> but for me, like specifically, like it sucked. You yeah, know? yeah. Yeah. And oh, for sure. And and dreams are crushed. Your mm-hmm. careers now. You don't know where it's gonna go. Yeah, I can. I mean, the military is a very secure feeling when you're in because, like, I used to, I used to look at it when, especially when I picked up E6. I was staffing, so I was like, it takes an act of Congress to break me down now. Like, I'm I'm set. I just ride this out, and I'm gonna collect my retirement. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's it's now you're like, F- yeah. Now what? And now on my way out because I made an ass out of myself, I'm getting kind of hazed by my own unit, and I'm like, uh, I'm a qualified JTAC. Like, what what is? Th- th- yeah. I haven't been treated like this since I was, you know, just a. Uh, junior going through Mm -hmm. the training like which we don't haze anymore but (laughs) you know um so it was super confusing i'm already in a dark spot because Mm -hmm. i'm told like you're never going to run again you're never going to have the livelihood you do um now and that was that was freaking it was tough um so obviously i'm i'm still full-time at this point because i'm going through the uh med board yeah meb What's or, that, sorry, MEB? The, MEB is med board. I'm okay. going through MedCon, which is essentially like you're hurt. We're going to pay you full time because at this point I was, uh, um, I got dropped from. I shouldn't say I got dropped, but our deployment was canceled. Okay. The one that I was training for, it took like a year and a half of assessing for it. Because the yep. way that we we get on deployments is we assess for other teams. Got it. Um, so like we, they don't typically 
deploy JTACs just like out. There's not a group of us that yep. go out. It's just we get attached to like a Green Beret or yeah, 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 yep. something, some other unit. Yeah. Um, and then the better you assess or the higher the prestige of the deployment, I guess I would put they it. They take like, higher qualified guys, more senior guys are going to get picked for those those yeah. deployments, especially if it's like, I don't know if SEALs use you guys, but more Delta. Yeah. So what berets then those high quality it's almost like a terp yeah the higher the quality of the unit the better terps they get and for us we were getting guys that couldn't even speak english or yeah. arabic yeah. <laughs> like, so yeah okay i get it so it's all off of a grading scale and so so yeah i was very excited for that deployment and then from the highest and this is kind of what started my entrepreneurial journey was um the the president ended up saying like no more special forces in this area anymore yeah. and it was like this hasn't happened since i mean we've had special forces in this this mm -hmm. ao since the 80s like what are you talking about you know and and that kind of like that's what turned me on to it was a very safe secure or secure like career field being in the military and i thinking through it of like i became the i was trying to become the best i could and be in that elite like i wanted to assess yep. and i wanted to I wanted to be the best. Mm -hmm. um, if you rate it towards like, you know, how not necessarily like by rank, but like what you get selected for. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and I got, I got turned off just, and it wasn't even just yeah. like this one guy. It was like this whole, there's no more, like no moss, like mm -hmm. the whole deployment got canceled. Yeah. And that's when I was like, all right. Cause I had a full time gig at the unit at that point. And I kind of walked away. I was like, peace dudes. Like, um, I'm going to go do my own thing. No idea what that own thing was, but yeah. I was like, I, I was like, I'm You're never going to have a out. job again and I'm never going to pay taxes again legally. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that was like my main goal. And, and that's what I've been pursuing for the last two years. So when this medical thing happened, I'm like, well, now I can't even be a tag P on the side, you know, like now I can't mm -hmm. even do this thing as a guard bum and like go hang out with the You're boys. Out, out. Like, well, I, I just can't operate. Like yeah. they won't keep me. And the way that this whole thing played out, which I don't really, I don't understand it um, because that one point, that one focal point, the POC, mm -hmm. the point of contact that I had, I couldn't get a arranged meeting with to save my life. Hmm. And this is multiple times of like going out and, and requesting a meeting with this person. Yeah. Like my unit was just kind of like safeguarding this it's, okay. it felt like yeah yeah um and this is just my rendition i don't know if that's actually the case but like this i can only speak my side of it you know for sure so all this is going on you're getting just dealt every shit card in the deck one after another after turning an acl so you get dished the news you're kind of getting pushed out from the unit how did you shift gears because obviously you got a lot going on now yeah so when did when did that moment come where you're like okay like I'm getting out. I right. got to figure my life out. I have, I put all of my cards in of being in TACP, being uh -huh. in the Air Force and careering it. Now what? Like now, because there's a lot of veterans or active duty that are not your scenario, but they're getting out or they're thinking about it. And it's a scary fucking moment right. when you're going from a guaranteed paycheck, guaranteed TRICARE, you're taking care of your kids, your family are taking care of. Now you're like... I have to take this step and it's the yeah. biggest step of your life. For sure. Like where, how did you, where, where did you go from there? I mean, like what, where did you start to pivot? They're like, okay, I'm going to, mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on something like what knowledge you have and wh how did you attack that? Yeah. So this kind of happened in two different parts um, where the first part was when that, that deployment um, went sideways. Okay. Like I just walked away. I was like, I'm done. I'm going to figure it out. I ended up going to real estate school cause uh, I don't, I, I actually to this day don't know why I went, to become a realtor, like no idea. Um, but I closed, so this is crazy. I closed on my primary residence with a VA loan. This was back in, I think 2021, um, like December of 2021. So a good year to, before the market started going to shit. Yeah. yeah. Um, or crazy, I should say. Yeah, it was right, right before. So I closed on it, it was like a 2.5% interest rate or less. Mm -hmm. um, the next day was when I got the news of my like, and the next day I basically quit my job. Really? Yeah. And I was like, okay, now I have this mortgage. And what I ended up doing was I, what's called house hacking. I rented out two of my rooms and that was enough money to pay for my mortgage and then put about 400 bucks in my pocket. So I was living like, I'm kind of like, I got a little bit of a nest egg. Mm -hmm. Like I can pay my bills for about a year. 
and I have my mortgage covered. So I'm like, I can just like figure, figure it out. this out. Yeah, you can figure it out. And I kind of saw, I saw that as like, oh, if I have an asset, and before this I started, I just had a chunk of money and I started like trying to day trade mm -hmm. and I got into crypto a little bit and I started building NFTs and I would build NFTs and, or not, uh, I would build NFT um, storefronts okay. and then I would sell them to people who wanted to build NFTs or whatever. And I kind of started a little business doing that while I was in, mm -hmm. kind of just do a side hustle. I was like, I want to do this while I'm over there, you yep. know, and like bring in side income and like kind of- Because you have all the time in the world when you're deployed. I mean, dude. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hours of nothing. Um, what happened was I did really, really well at that. Okay. So when tax season came around, I got uh, raped, absolutely boned. And okay. I'm like, I'm not going to take a hundred percent of the risk to give you 40% of what I oh, make absolutely. and then maybe, you know, lose everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, how do I not pay taxes? So I'm looking at like moving to like the key islands or like Costa Rica or something. An offshore account. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. You and hear then, all the stories. And then I get into, that's, that's why I went to real estate school. Um, Cause then I, I find real estate and I'm like, oh, depreciation. And yep. like everything I put into this because it's a rental property, I get to write, write it off. off. Yep. I'm like, whoa. Um, so then I started trying to educate people on like how to how to purchase a home and to do it as an investment property, but you like as a primary residence that you want to convert to a, a okay specifically veterans because like the VA loan is one of the most like sound, uh, extremely valuable financial products known to man that. Yes, but the information is so misused, mm -hmm. un misunderstood, because my wife's an agent. Yeah. And so she does a lot with vets too, but mm -hmm. she became an agent because we got horrible advice and I blew through my whole life, not life savings, yeah. but my 401k pull drain. That's how she was like, we got screwed so bad. She's yeah. like, this will never happen to us again. I'm going to become an agent just from what we learned. Mm -hmm. But it's so sad that there's so many veterans out there that have or qualified for the VA and they have no idea where to even start or how to use yeah. it. So is that something that like you've kind of really dove into lately for the veteran community or any veterans listening to like, hey, there's, I mean, we don't have to go, they can reach out and we'll link everything to you at the end. I mean, I'm sure we can talk for hours about the VA because yeah. I've listened to my wife on the phone all the time about it. But so how did, so you started learning things, right? Mm -hmm. So we can get, maybe let's hit some cliff notes like, hey, there, there's, there's, there's huge advantages of using your VA loan. Because yeah. you could buy technically a second home with it if you're already, ha I mean, there's so much stuff. I don't even right. know how to like, yeah, you dive into this. Yeah, you can the VA loan. And I don't, I don't just focus on, on veterans and using yeah, yeah. the VA loan. It's just a very, very powerful loan product mm -hmm. because you can go in for 0% down and you don't have to do insurance or mortgage insurance yeah. on it. So it's, it's a very cheap product to use. So I take all this information. I go back to my, my unit. I'm like, guys, you know that you can buy more houses with your VA loan. So just like refinance out of that, take into an FHA loan mm -hmm. and then you could You're even do a cash, yeah, cash out refi and then go buy another primary residence. And what I was saying, like, if you do this once a year, like I know it sucks to move, but if you do that once a year or once every other year, by the time you get to your 20 years and you do that all the way through the military, you would have 10 homes. So why aren't they teaching us this in the military? This is the, one of the most frustrating parts of me that they, the military 100%, I'm, mm -hmm. I'll probably get some, uh, one of them, this guy I work with very well. He's big in the military and help. No one ever, ever was like, hey, guys, we're going to sit you down for a financial savings yeah. class. Or, hey, you guys have this thing called the mm -hmm. VA loan. If you start buying now a rental property in your little hillbilly-ass town you're from, right. by the time you retire, you could own the fucking town. Yeah. Like, it's so frustrating for us. So you're, you're mm -hmm. figuring out these, these little... I mean, I want to answer that question um, because... I believe, and this is where it's going to get hot. We're going to get, we're okay. going to, this is a hot take. I believe that's the answer to that question is the same reason why they don't teach us how to write checks in school. In school. Why don't they don't teach us how to invest our money or how to use our money or what even money is? Because they say like, basically you have to work for 20 years to build up your retirement. But by the time you get to that 20 year mark, like money is not going to be worth the same. Mm -mm. Money is just a transfer of energy. Mm -hmm. And if you're just gathering money that is losing, it's dissipating its energy. You have to spend it on things that will start generating an income that keep up with inflation. 
And I believe that's from the Rockefellers. I mean, they, oh, they sure. dumped money into the school system. Yeah, I'm a tin hat, bro. Oh, I will dive. We're, we're going for <laughs> I'll it. I'll dive. It, this might, we don't, we're going to have to come back and do yeah. another episode on that. But yeah, bro, I'm 100%. Like, they set you up to fail so bad. And then they're like, we don't know why all these guys are struggling. We don't know why there's the homeless population mm-hmm. is fucking 50% vet. I don't know the exact percent yeah. of veterans. Don't call me on that. But there's such... We are we fail as a society, and you go from being these war fighters and mm. learning all these traits and skills, and then all of a sudden one day they're like, "Hey, ha-, like you just got out what, a couple days ago." Yeah. How yeah. many? Like it was last week, last Friday. Last so, Friday. Yeah, okay, today's like Monday. Four days. Four days. You've been out of the middle, and if you didn't have what you, I would be. I would. I wouldn't have anything. I would have a bullet in my head. That's what I would have. Yeah. And this is why. This is why I'm so passionate about this. Is because. The military will use you up. The government will sure. use you up and then make you fucking kill yourself. For sure. I like, feel why it. would they want pa- we might have to edit this. No. Why would they want patriots to be armed and trained? And have knowledge. And have knowledge. But the thing is, is they can't keep somebody in the military. If I if I had the six rental properties that I bought last year. You're not gonna stay in. You're gonna you're making chump change and your homes are, are exactly. producing. Exactly. Why like, would you stay in? They wanna keep us dependent. They wanna mm-hmm. keep us sheep. Mm-hmm. You know? And then they wanna give us a rifle and tell us to go kill babies. Yeah, I get it. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting all fired up. No, I get it. I mean, I was never told to kill babies, but... My point isn't to (laughs) say, like, the military is bad. My point is to say, like, I think everybody should do a job that they love to do or do whatever they want. Yeah, and there's people in the military that absolutely love their jobs. I mean, I have buddies that are career in it, and I mean, they're literally retiring this the end of last year now, so I would be at that stage in my career, which is, I look back at it, and I'm like... Thank God I got out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but I did it because I have so much more going for me now that I got out of the military. But you're right though, man. I mean, they train us and 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 but to, to be war fighters and and then what? Like as I'm getting out, they're like, Oh, this is how you write a resume. Like, mm-hmm. oh, I drive tanks and pull triggers and throw grenades. Like yeah. well, like there's there's nothing like that. And there's no fight. I mean, they give you these bullshit financial classes that you sit for and but you're you're checked out. You're right. getting out you could smell the barn. I mean, I'm headed home. I'm EAS and mm-hmm. soon, like the last thing I give a shit about is a resume. Like I'm just going to fucking wing it. You know, yeah. like I just give me, I, that's how I was when I, when I was ready to go, I was ready to go. And so that's kind of, I don't know what that whistling was, but um, that's kind of one of those things like, but you're, it, it, you're hundred percent right. It's, it's, we're set to just fail. I'm mean, and I believe that it does go back. If we have all of these young Marines or young, just active service members, do, service members any branch, but you have a couple of rentals and you're, you're able, you have that entrepreneur right. mindset. You, why, why would anybody in their right mind, unless you, you truly love the military, but if mm-hmm. dude, I, I had a couple houses that were pumping out enough for me to survive, I yeah. would have been out in a heartbeat. Well, the thing is, is even if you love the military and you love your job and you want to yeah. stay in for your 20, I would have still stayed in for my, mm-hmm. my 20 if I could have. I, what I suggest is why not be financially independent without your job Mm -hmm. and this is not just for the military this is for any job like do your job if you love it that's cool i don't care like i'm not trying to say you have to be an entrepreneur you have to be have a bunch of rental properties but why not do both you have a guaranteed paycheck in the military i mean the Mm -hmm. the smartest option would be to stay in yeah you have the guaranteed paycheck in the military it's never going to go anywhere Mm -hmm. and that's where they should be teaching these men and women how to side hustle right there's so much that they could be doing online in their communities anything like that Mm -hmm. or at least their children why are you not teaching teaching your children how to side hustle or just the hustle period yeah. because every single cent that you profited, none of it would ever be touched because you have your guaranteed paycheck from the military. Right. Granted, I don't know your, your finances, yeah. but in sense, you should be able to make a hundred, like profit everything that you're making outside of the military. Mm-hmm. And it's like, but nobody ever uh, I mean, I would I would like to think things are changing now because obviously the entrepreneur mindset yeah. is growing and like I mean look what you're mm-hmm. doing now I mean all of us in this room now have things going for us so but it's like I didn't when I was even as a staff NCO a twenty something year old guy like right. dude I was renting a house and driving to work every day doing my job if someone like hey dude you, you buy a house now flip this thing you can pro like no and so I think that's a big part in the veteran or the, the service member world. I think that's something that really needs to change is to start changing the mindset, it, yeah. especially as we're kind of drifting away from war times. I can mm-hmm. see when I was in like that. I mean, dude, I was literally 
did my first deployment, I was back six months. And before my seventh month mark, I was back in Iraq again. Yeah. And then it was just like over. So, I mean, we were obviously we were operating at a much higher yeah. tempo than I think a lot of these guys are now. I would love to reach out or have somebody reach out that was listening that is in the and see if they are, are going, doing that route. And if yeah. they're not, why not? Why are these staff? And because I know there's a lot. I have buddies that are, I mean, one of my business partners that I'm working with, he's still, he's a reservist. Um, he runs a command for a reservist unit and it's like, he's so smart. It's like mm-hmm. he helps, but like who else is giving back? It's, it's a crazy mindset because like I was almost shunned from when I did this entrepreneurial thing and yeah. I'm like trying to teach and I'm, I'm just like young, like, dude, did you guys, did you guys know you could do this? And it's like, mm-hmm. the, Oh, I don't want to take on more debt. I don't want to, like, I want to pay off my, my, my mortgage is never this, going to yeah as fast as possible and it's like no don't like leverage that money yes. like, and then put a renter in there and they're paying that and then that's a tax write off mm-hmm. and like you know getting all like crazy i'm just like golden retriever energy and these guys are like Dude, I'm i think not- a lot of it has to do though and i and i'll probably say this all the time on this podcast is nobody hates successful veterans more than veterans mm-hmm when you start hearing, you're like, I don't know what it is. I mean, I, you get crucified for it. Indoctrination, it's, man. They like the I, military does not want you to be. They want you to be reliant on the military. They don't want well, you to be the, successful the on the your government. own. Yeah, the government wants you to be reliant on the government. I mean, look at everything that's happening in the world. Yeah. Because if you're not, then why would you be there? Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's like an abusive relationship, you know. So. To kind of shift gears a little bit, are you thinking about starting or a little little business in order to, or how, if I was a vet listening to this and I'm like, man, this guy, okay, like if he's, if he's got, how many houses do you have up there, if you don't mind me asking? I have nine properties. Okay, you got nine properties, so you're doing really well. And if I was listening, like, is there, are there little, are you putting together like clinics, seminars? Is there anything that these people can reach out to you and be like, okay, Hey, listen, dude, like, I want to know, like, yeah. is there any advice? I mean, that we can, you can send people. I mean, how would they, how do we go about that route? Yeah, totally. So I tell everyone I don't sell anything. Yeah. Um, but I put out a lot of free information and okay. I do that on all the socials and I'm starting to get into YouTube. And then, uh, my wife is, she's a gangster pilot and she's helping people get into the aviation community. Cause that's a whole nother, like aviate aviation is a community that's ran by the slumlord that is the FAA. You know? We're going to have her on. Yeah. I got to, oh, I got to hear about is, this. She is the one you actually want to listen to. Okay. Like, she is brilliant. Um, but so you're putting out free information. Yeah. And so we do it on, uh, I'm on, I'm on all the socials. Um, the underscore Matthew underscore McKee. All right. We'll tag you in all that. Yeah. Yeah. And really what I want, like I solve problems for other people. So I go in and I do coaching and I do all that. Cool. But it's not, necessarily like I'm putting stuff together and I'm trying to sell it. I just solve problems for people who have more money than me. Yeah. yeah. So they want to pay me to solve their problems, you Got know, because their problems so I can essentially pay somebody else to solve my problems, you know? Yep. Um and rich people pay better than poor people. But for ever like I did this thing in the last two years and mul- most of the properties I bought were creative finance. So it was like subject to stuff and it was uh assuming loans or okay. it was um owner finance and just finding those deals and whatnot. Yep. Um, most of the people I try to communicate to is like the people that are just getting in and maybe have a home or don't have a home yet. And it's just like trying to tell them what the power that they're missing out on. First is. time home buyers, your, yeah, your, your starter family. Mm-hmm. But how to leverage that to become an investor in the future Got it. without taking away their livelihood now, just kind of showing them the other side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, that's cool, man. Yeah. I mean, I just, cause I had a lot of mentors that got me where I am today Yeah, and a lot of people that didn't need to take the time to do it. And Mm -hmm. if I, my biggest thing now is if, if somebody does reach out, it doesn't have to be about finances too. I got hosed on my way out, you know, like Mm -hmm. it was like kind of a perfect storm of how not, how this dude is not going to get any benefits, how he's not going to get a military retirement, how he's not like now I have to fight with the VA to get anything covered um, Mm -hmm. and get it military cover or military related or whatever the term is um, service related service connected. Sorry. Sorry guys. If you're adding that Uh, (laughs) to get it service connected, um, there's too many vet suicides for sure. And I think a big struggle is finances. hundred percent. So it's not just like real estate. You don't have to pay me to be your realtor. You don't have to buy my class, but I want to keep bullets out of vets heads. For sure. Like if you need someone to reach out to you, or if you want to reach out to someone and to talk to them, like 
you have my social, like talk to me, we can BS, yep. you know, like I just want to help vets in, in the good times or in the bad times, dude. Like I'm, it's, it's to get rid of that loneliness, right? Like mm-hmm. the, the stress, the loneliness. Yeah. I mean, and obviously with, with me having an organization and we're about to be hit our 10 year mark, I think dude. next week is going to be a decade of doing this. Like I got good, dude, I yeah. never thought in a million years I'd have a, one, a business that's about to hit a decade and two, a charity out of all things. But it fucking sucks, man, what these guys and girls go through, especially when they're getting out. And that transition stage is the most vulnerable stage that, you know, and we've, there's things I'm going to talk about down the road that is going to, it is going to be a hot fucking topic yeah. in the veteran world. But I feel at this point in my life, I can talk about them because I've, I've watched this for, I'm not, I just haven't started this, right? It's been 10 years of yeah. dealing with vets, wounded vets, broken vets, lonely vets, like the, the dark side of the veteran community. There's a lot of growth and there's a lot of great things that are happening. But I feel that if, if there is a vets that are out there that can offer anything like you, just mm-hmm. offering, hey, you need, that's what the veteran community needs now more than ever because obviously with politics and the way this country is looking and just the – it sucks, especially when you serve your country, deployed or not, or you sign that dotted line to defend this country forward and, and here – and then to see this stuff, it really weighs on the veteran community right now. And so I think that's where really it's, I, I commend you for just throwing yourself out there and letting us put your social out there as far as, man, you went through a pretty shitty time. You got kind of exiled from your unit, your yeah. fault or not. And, you know, and then you had, you went from riding this wave, like the all American dream and you finally got your dream job and now it just, everything crumbled. You instead of getting down on yourself, which I'm, it happens, yeah. but you didn't stay there. Right. You find a way to, Hey, the fuck I got to do next. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, th- and that's, that's where I feel that a lot of vets just have that heart. And I've gone through my dark times. Everybody has, but it's like, okay, how long am I going to let this last? Like yeah. this sucks. You know, I got out of the military to better my life, but now I have nothing like, you know, and it's just like, am I going to, what was me my whole life right. or, but it's, it, it's like, where do you start? Who do, who do we're like, you know, so the fact that we're able to share that with here with you is like, okay, guys, like we're going to link your, all of your social on here. And I hope people reach out and, you know, it's like, I hope we can really get some guys are just to start yeah. thinking that that mindset, like there's so much money to be made out there these mm-hmm. days uh, between side hustles and real estate investing crypto whatever it is Mm -hmm. and i'm going to have a guy on um here soon that i mean he's a crypto god and so he's going to walk through so we can see just his points and little little tricks because i'm going to jump into it this year i've i've fought it for years and this is the year i'm like fuck it i sat down with my wife we're going to do it but it's just taking those little steps right like where do i start and so that's where i want to help people with that as well and so they can follow a journey but man it's 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 been awesome Talk to you. I know we have so much more. I think I might have you on with your wife because I mean you're doing. So, I mean, is there anything you want to ca- touch on real quick before we wrap this up? But man, it's been pretty. You, yeah, it's you're been great. I'm doing it all. I, so, I really I mean, appreciate you bringing me on, and I'm I'm excited to. I know we're gonna try to um, do some stuff. I scheduled a, yes. a trip in May. Okay, so it, let's touch on that really quick. Yeah. So you got your pilot's license, right? Yeah, I'm like and, uh, right at my check ride. So I so just you ride your check ride. ride. Your wife, mm-hmm. you got to ring on. Your wife yep. has got her pilot's license. Did you guys? After we met mm-hmm. and filled out on one of our trip slips, which yeah. was, I mean, it was pretty easy for you. That's, yeah. So that's pretty new. So the, I want I want to hear you. We'll get into that off air, I guess. Okay. So we send you a trip slip, and how it kind of works for people listening is with our organization. We sent if you host an event or you just have a skill or a trade yeah. or anything like you, mm-hmm. you and your wife, you fly into the back country, you got your little planes, and you guys filled out one of our trip slips. We're like, hey, let's take these vets into the back country yeah. of Idaho, fly around. We could land, play golf, mm-hmm. eat some lunch. And then we're back in Boise by Dude. dinner. Yeah, and we want this to be like an ongoing thing. For so, sure. Um, my my wife, she's a ATP, so an airline transport pilot. Um, so she's she has like thirty five hundred hours. Good she's, for her. She's yeah, uh, very successful high hour pilot. Um, she's also a CFI, uh, so that's just a certified flight instructor. Mm-hmm. Um, so the thought is like actually getting the vets in and like letting them go teach them how to land a plane. Yeah. You know, and like let Absolutely. them fly it. To, tool around a little bit and then i'm really into like mindset of how not just like the financial thing like the financial i believe financial security is a big struggle for vets but absolutely i think i only got there because i had the mindset of 
um, having to become independent and then just mm-hmm. self-reflecting on like, this is maybe it's not my fault that this happened, but it's my responsibility to deal with it. Yeah. So I really want to like mentor and coach other people, you know, around me of how do we obtain a self-reliant mindset coming out of being so indoctrinated on being reliant on another service, you know, hundred percent. Um, it takes a lot to unbrainwash yourself you, from and, the military. Yeah, it's indoctrination. And that's mm. like, this is kind of coming from my psyop days of like, <laughs> for sure, this is shit that I did, yeah. you know, at a well, much sure. smaller scale, but I get to watch it in the news and I get to watch it real time. And I'm like, we're doing this to our citizens, like 100%. our civilians or our, <clears throat> serv- especially our service members, mm-hmm. you know, and 100%. it's like, it breaks my heart. And that's why I want to combat that. And I think like you were touching on the, the, um, the veteran community is it, it, it's our responsibility now. Like mm-hmm. they've had, I mean, how long have we had the VA, right? There's, there's a government funded, I don't know why I did that, but it's a government funded, like the VA is out there yep. and everybody complains about it. There's mm-hmm. not a single night good review that I've heard. It is our responsibility to build that community yep. and give people resources to go out and talk to Like, I don't know how I'm going to help these people yeah. if, or these vets. I don't know how I'm going to help them, but if somebody reaches out to me, I'm going to fucking figure it out. You yep. know, absolutely. Like, uh, same with you and same absolutely. with what you've been doing for a decade. And you're doing amazing things. So I want to be a part of that. I just want to go and like freaking if I can fly someone around and help them. That sounds like a horrible day. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it sounds like a horrible you know, day. We go play golf and stuff. Yeah. Like, why not? I yeah. mean, and even if that brightens that guy's day up or that woman's day up where they come home to their loved one or whatever, they're like, Fuck, today was a good day. Yeah. And that starts that motivation because that's all it sometimes it takes right. is just that l- the little spark inside of these alone. guys. Like no. we all got fucked over at one point. hundred percent. And so if we can show them like, yo, this is our story. These, this is what, but this is what we're doing now. Yeah. Like this is how we're able to help. And if that turns one guy or girl around where they're like, man, like, okay, let's do it. Like, I'm going to get off my ass. I'm going to stop. Dude, my biggest thing this year, I got off social. Dude. Greatest thing. I, yeah. It sucks for me because I run a living off of, so, not my personal, but like right. I run businesses, socials. But now with mine, I've completely gotten, I'm, I mean, it's only been, I think like eight, what's the day of the day? It's, it's only been a week, but my wife and like, it's sad to me of how much anger, depression, just, oh, yeah. wait, wait. On, cause yeah. I'm, I'm just fucking all day scrolling mm-hmm. and I'm just seeing this negative bullshit all day long. And the second I remove that, bro, it is. Yeah. One, I've gotten so much done. I mean, for, for Christ's sakes, with the Brothers Rabe here, credit to those guys, launched our Dude, podcast. Those dudes. You know, I'm getting starting so many adventures this year already that it would I would have not been giving 100% of my attention to, and I think that is a big thing, just getting these guys unplugged. I went right. to uh, physical therapy yesterday, yesterday. And my guy, you know, he's he's the complete opposite of what I am. Love the dude, but we are not, like, <laughs> on the same path. Political, light, whatever. He's like, man, did you hear what's going on? I was like, I don't know anything. Don't know, he, don't and he's care. looking at me like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm, dude, yeah. I am. And he's like, oh my God, this year already. And he starts yeah. listing off all this shit. And I was like, you know what? Doesn't affect me because if the world's going to end, it's fucking ending anyways, if I'm watching it end or not. Uh-huh. Now I just, I don't have to, I don't have to wait or I don't have to carry that weight anymore. Yeah. So that was my, my was one of my biggest, my biggest new year's goals to myself is the detox and i'm going to give myself 21 days to start a new habit and it's mainly to start building my habits now and without a phone and then i'm going to look at that as far as just business i have my business hours do what i have to do and it goes away and that's how i have i dude i'm one of those people i got pulled into the addiction Mm -hmm. wasn't the likes or comments it's i built a community in my direct messages and I post one thing, dude, and I'm talking to 50 people all day. And it just, that's what consumed my time. And so I have to like turn all that off. And, yeah. But that's where it starts is finding those little things like, okay, what's my first step? Do I put the bottle down? Do I stop smoking weed all freaking day, right? Yeah. Like, and, and, and that's what we need to get the vets into. So, dude, once again, thank you so much for coming on. I know uh, I was excited. I want to have more conversations about you. One more time, give up any information where people can reach out to you and then go from there. Yeah. Okay, cool. So it's the Matthew McKee at, uh, oh, sorry. It's the underscore Matthew underscore McKee, um, M A T T H E W M C K E E. And then I just want to hit on, like, I'm going the opposite direction that you are. And it's from a mentor that 
uh, I listen to all the time and he, he provided this and it was in a story form. So he's like, Hey, let's say every day after work, you get off and you watch friends for three hours, um, every single day, seven days or five days a week, Yep. instead of consuming information. So like I'm on my phone all the time now, but I never consume the information I'm creating information because I'm kind of going the, the digital real estate route of okay. like, I'm trying to build YouTube videos and I'm trying to build cool. Katie's YouTube stuff. Cause she's a super interesting person and it's just telling the story. And, and basically it's like, Hey, instead of watching every, watching put it out. friends, put like, something that people will watch. Yeah. Put a, put a podcast on friends and tell them everything that you love about friends and why yep. you love it and the stories and like, and start breaking things down. Yep. And if you do that for 10 years, and you, you commit to the input. You don't commit to the outcome. So you don't care about, I want 50 likes on this, yep. or I don't want 10 million followers in the first year. You just say, I'm going to post once a week for 10 years. Um, by that 10 years, you're probably going to be a lot better at YouTube or mm -hmm. social media than you were when you started. Oh, for sure. And you're going to have something that, you know, you may, you have a, I don't know, I don't I'm not going to throw a percentage out there, but you have a chance. Yep. You have a chance of somebody consuming you and going viral and making money off that. If you're just sitting watching Netflix every day, not getting anywhere. Zero percent chance you're going to make money from that. Mm -mm. You know, unless you like, I don't know, reviews or yeah. splice it or yeah, something yeah, like that. I don't yeah, know. There's somebody's sure. going to drop in the comments and be like, "Oh, really? Because I make ten million dollars a I'm year." I'm 15 years yeah. old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, shut up, kid. Um, <laughs> yeah, I get it. But dude, this was great. Thanks for letting me cool, man. talk at you Glad for you came on an hour and a half. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, no, we've done longer. So I appreciate it. Thanks, dude. Right on. Thanks, buddy. Cool.